And all right, well, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew 27. And actually, I'm uh, wrapping up this series. I say kind of open in. I say I'm wrapping up a series that's going to really lead us into uh, Resurrection Sunday. Our Easter service is next Sunday. But we've been in a series here called The Cross, simply and powerfully called The Cross. Amen, Brother Francis? The Cross. We've been in this series for a couple weeks now, and today's week three. And we'll be in Matthew 27 in a minute. And again, if you haven't... Uh, been here, you miss, go to our new website, go check it out, right? It'll be up there. It'll be one of the first ones you can listen to, you can watch it. Of course, you can go to YouTube, our podcast, uh, all those different places, Vimeo, if you want to check it out over there as well. And so again, the cross is the epicenter of our faith. Amen? As born again believers, as Christians, it's the epicenter of our faith. Without the death, burial, and of course, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Our, 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 our faith uh, would be useless, so to speak, or uh, would have no merit to it. And we saw about the Old Testament, and I'll show you again. I just read again this morning in my daily read. I'm going to tell you later how the Old Testament types, shadows, pictures was pointing to the cross the whole time. The prophets, we read the prophet Isaiah 53, 3 and 9, right? Uh, just prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus was born specifics about the cross. And we've seen and we'll see again today, it was the main focus of the preaching and the writings of the Apostle Paul, right? So week one, just a quick recap. We saw reasons why Jesus had to suffer, right? The cup of suffering when he was praying in the garden and he said in sweat and drops of blood, he said, Father, may this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. We talked about it was the cup he knew of suffering he had to drink and there was a few reasons, many reasons. We looked at four. He suffered for our sins so we can be sanctified. Next, he was bound so we could live free. He was bound up in chains and ropes into the whipping post and to the cross so we could live free. Second part of our vision, it's God's vision. We showed you last month or in January from Ephesians. We want you to know God, live free, find your purpose, and make a, a, a difference with your life. That'll last for eternity. Thirdly, he took the curse so we could be redeemed. And then he was rejected so we can be accepted. Then last week, we saw the two sides of the cross, right? Jesus was nailed to the cross. We've been looking at that. But all through scriptures, Jesus, all through the gospels, tells us we must pick up our cross daily and follow him. The apostle Paul talks about, I've been crucified with Christ. It says those that have been saved and born again, they, they nail their, their sinful nation and, and, and nature and passions and desires to the cross. And that's why I called it two sides of the cross. And we see from the gospels, Number one, Simon reminds us that we must carry our cross, as I mentioned. Secondly, Jesus and the weeping women there at the cross showed us compassion for the lost. They were weeping for Jesus, but Jesus turned to the women and said, don't cry for me, cry for yourselves and for your children. And he also said he wept when he got to Jerusalem because they were rejected the offer of salvation. He, he had a burden for those that would not be saved. And it shows us we need to have a compassion and burden for the lost. By the way, again, I hope that stirs you up. I'm not just asking you to, to, to uh, invite people to our Easter services next week so we can have a higher attendance. No, I'm asking you to invite people because I hope you have a burden for the loss. Amen? And that people, yes, we would have a higher attendance, but for the sake of people coming in that don't know Jesus, that they would hear the gospel, that they would surrender, and that they would be born again and their lives would be forever and eternally changed. Amen? That's the, the I'm hoping. We prayed that last week, that we would all have a greater burden and compassion for lost souls. And then thirdly, Jesus responded to mockers and the criminals on the cross with forgiveness and salvation. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. The very people who had tortured him, beat him, and are nailing him to that cross, he prayed that the Lord would forgive him, that the Father would forgive him. And then the one thief, one gospel tells us that they were both mocking him. And then we saw in Luke, one thief turned to him and said, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. He repented. He had a change of heart, and Jesus assured him of salvation. Amen? Today I want to start with one of the verses we read in Luke last week, and that's Luke 23, just to seal it where we're at. Not to seal it, but just to, to launch back to see where we're at. One of the most powerful and crucial parts of this was Luke 23, 33. It says, when they came to the place called Golgotha, or the skull, they nailed him to the cross. Remember, we talked about it. it was our sins that put him there, right? It was us. The Romans actually physically nailed him, but it was you and I's sins who, 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 who actually nailed him there. Now, from there, let's read, if you're in the book of Matthew, chapter 27, let's read a few verses now. And we're going to look at a few different gospels here, Luke, Matthew, and then we're going to go to John in a minute. Then Jesus shouted again, 
shouted out again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain or the veil in the temple of the, uh, the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many people. We're going to be looking at that next week on Resurrection Sunday. That's powerful right there. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the great and powerful message of the cross. Lord, the implication, Lord God, of the cross and, 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 and what it's done in our life and what it's going to continue to do all through eternity. Let us not take the cross lightly, although we sing about it, hear about it, have pictures about it, necklaces and shirts and bumper stickers. Let us never, ever, ever forget the power of what you've done on the cross, how you died in our place, shed your blood, Lord God, for us. And Lord God, what that means for us each and every day. Help us, Holy Spirit, to not only receive it, but to apply it. But Holy Spirit, help me also as I preach today. I cannot do this on my own, nor do I want to. Lord, I need your help. In Jesus' name. Amen. The fact that Jesus shouted with a loud voice indicates that he was in complete control of his mind, his body, and his spirit. The Bible says that he released his spirit. Amen. They technically, they didn't take his life. He gave it up, right? He laid down his life and then he, in this moment, he released his spirit and died. You know, 2 Corinthians 13 tells us that though he was crucified in weakness, he exercised wonderful power we see here at the very moment that he died. Three miracles took place simultaneously that day. The veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. An earthquake shook all of Israel, and we don't know how much of the earth, but it opened the graves and some godly men and women arose from the dead. Again, we'll look at that more next week on Resurrection Sunday. The ripping of the veil symbolized the wonderful truth that the way now to God is open. We looked at this in Hebrews last uh, year. There was no need, no more need for temples and priests and altars and sacrifices. Jesus had finished the work of salvation on the cross, which he said himself in John 9, 19, I'm sorry, John 19, 28 through 30. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and released his spirit. I love that. He knew that his, his mission was now finished. I love how the New Living says that. See, Jesus came to earth to make a difference. Amen. Ultimately, he made it a difference that changed all of our lives and all of eternity, right? He knew at that moment it was finished. He did everything he needed to do to secure our eternity and our salvation. We see, as we just saying that, our God is a way maker. Amen? We see that all through, again, the Old Testament. God made a way for the Israelites through the Red Sea. He made springs of water in the desert. He brought manna from heaven. He gave oil to a widow that wouldn't stop until the jars stopped coming. He kept on flowing out oil so she can have enough money to pay off debt and provide for her family. Christ himself is the way. God is the way maker. He is the way, right? He tells us that in John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let me pause right now and ask you something. Is there something in your life? that only the Lord can make a way through. As we just prayed, and I just sensed the, the, the burden of some of you, but at the same time, since the peace, the burden of all these, these people we're praying for, whether it be Mr. Kenneth in the hospital or, or, you know, Pastor Josh and his family and Church of the King there, and a heavy burden they're, they're carrying today and they're walking through right now. Maybe you have something going on, and you know it's only God that can make a way through the circumstance. Anybody out there say, man, that's me, that's me. I just want to let you know our God is a way maker. Amen? And specifically, we see as we wrap up uh, this time focusing on the cross, of course, we'll talk about the cross some more uh, a little bit next week as well, but we're going to mainly be focusing on the resurrection. When Christ died on the cross, he made a way for all humanity. That's many different things, but three specific, three, three specific things. That's a tongue twister right there. Come on, Lord, you made a way for me to talk properly as I preach. 
Three key areas that the Lord made a way in. Number one, Christ made a way out for us. Christ made a way out for us. Come on, one sister was excited about that. Thank you. Hallelujah. Matthew 27, 53 and 52. Let's read it again. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. I'm going to dive into that more, but again, that's a picture right there. That really happened. It's something supernatural that happened. But let me ask you this question. And I know what the word, the word actually means fear. So, you know, God wants to free you. But how many people we got in here are claustrophobic? You say, man, that's me. Maybe riding on an airplane, maybe an elevator. Maybe uh, I see Karen over there. Maybe, but Hezekiah's tunnel, right? <laughs> we went to Israel. We walked through Hezekiah's tunnel. And uh, that thing was tight. You had to get down. It was close. You had water. Uh, but actually... You know, Karen said that, but my, my, her and my wife prayed and the Lord delivered her, right, Karen? And, you know, but she was, but even my wife going through Hezekiah's tunnel, maybe, you know, uh, if you ever been to the beach with your kids or grandkids and they buried you in the sand, any of those things, if you're claustrophobic, you're looking for a way out, right? I tell you what, and my wife's not in here right now in the moment, but she was looking for a way out in Hezekiah's tunnel. When we got in there, it, it really, and there was some, some other people that went before to Israel and, and, and you feel like you, you stuck, you trapped in, and you're just looking for a way out. Well, listen, life might be going great for you right now, and that's awesome. I hope it is. But I want you to know something, and I think you already know this, but I want to remind you, all of us who have been born on this planet one day will die. Unless Jesus comes back first, unless we get raptured, we all going to die. We all go that way one day. Amen? Days like today, as we pray for people, we realize that, right? So we need a way out. We needed a way, an escape from death. We can't all technically escape death where our physical bodies will die. But you know what? When Jesus' climactic death happened on the cross, it inaugurated the kingdom of God by breaking the powers of death. Amen? We will still physically die, but listen, it doesn't end there. Our bodies physically die, but that's not it. If we take Jesus out of the equation, though, then we're hopeless. We're all going to spend eternity somewhere. But think about people that don't even, don't even believe in an afterlife. We know, and I hope you know, and by the end of the service, if you don't, I hope to encourage you and, and persuade you to know that there is an eternity for everyone. We all will live in eternity somewhere, either eternally separated from the Lord are in glory with him. But there's some people that don't believe, don't have any faith, don't believe in God, don't believe there's an afterlife. I had one of my best friends. Sadly, I did his funeral my age about three or four years ago. I remember sitting on his front porch and we had a conversation about the afterlife. And neither I, I wasn't saved at the time and, and neither was he. And, and I, I grew up, you know, at least in a church believing in God. And I, sh I shared that, that, you know, I knew Jesus was his son. I just didn't realize why he was hanging on that cross, right? But I asked him, and I said, man, what do you think happens whenever we die? You think we go to heaven or go to hell or any of that kind of stuff? He said, man, none of that stuff is true. He's like, when we die, we just end up in the ground and we end up worm food. What a sad way to live. What a hopeless way to live. To think that death is the final say over you. Well, let me encourage you. When Jesus died on the cross, he broke the powers of death, hell, and the grave. Amen? He made a way. That's what the Bible tells us. Look at this in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood. The son also became flesh and blood. The son being Jesus became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. I love that. Who had the power of death. Now only in this way could he set free all who would live their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. That is a powerful verse right there. To all those who live their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. You know, I just heard about a, 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 a someone recently that is living this way currently. Just recently I heard about this. Well, this person doesn't want to go too far, doesn't want to go on trips too far, doesn't want his loved ones out of his sight. In case something happens, in case 
someone dies. And I even, I even called this person, trying to keep it very general because this person doesn't come to church or anything, but just trying to keep it general and ask permission if we could use this because, and that's what it is. I said, man, he's bound up. He's living as a slave to the fear of dying, to the fear of death. Listen, church, brothers and sisters, born again believers, we don't have to fear death. It's actually a glorious thing when these bodies of ours die. Amen. So in what sense did Satan have the power over death? The final authority over death, obviously, we know is in the hands of the Lord. Satan can only do what is permitted by God. You see that in the book of Job. You can read that in Job 1 and Job chapter 2. But because Satan is the author of sin and sin brings death, in this sense, Satan exercised power over the realm of death. Jesus even called him a murderer in John 8, 44. But you see, Satan, more importantly, uses the fear of death as a terrible weapon to gain control over the lives of people. He's a kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of death, right? And as I just mentioned, I know someone personally right now, I heard of someone, should I say, and you may know someone, maybe it's you, maybe you're watching online, and you may not say it, you may not show it, but there's this constant underline that you're scared of dying. You don't have to be scared of dying. Amen. I mean, I get it. I mean, I still feel like I'm a, a young man, a very young man, by the way. I mean, I don't, I don't want to die. I don't want to, like, I mean, I still feel like the Lord has a lot for me to do, and I, I got a precious family. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, so privileged to, to lead this amazing church. I mean, I don't want to die. It's not that I'm looking for it, but we have to know that we don't have to fear death. That, honestly, we, we really not even dying. When you're, when you're born again, I love how Pastor Todd always said, when really when the believer dies, they're really not dying. They're just changing addresses. Come on, somebody. Anybody ever moved before? You just move from one location to another. Come on, we're just passing through. We just end up in our, in our permanent heavenly home. Amen? Right? See, those of us who trust in Jesus have once and for all been delivered from Satan's authority and the terrible fear of death. He made a way out of death. Yes, our bodies will die, but again, he defeated death, hell, and the grave, right? Amen. Again, I read this morning, I'm reading through Joshua, just started reading through Joshua again in my daily time, and there's another great picture of this, of the cross in the book of Joshua with Rahab. When Rahab hid the two spies, Joshua sent two spies out to Jericho to go spy out the land, right? Rahab hid the two spies, and they came looking for him. It's like, no, we're not here anymore, but she hid them. And how she helped them to escape was she let a scarlet rope, she let them down by a scarlet rope out of the window, and she said, hey, run off, go hide in the hills till the men are looking for you, were, were, are gone. And look, she helped them escape to a way out so they wouldn't be captured and probably killed, right, if the people in Jericho would have caught them. And then later he says, hey, because you've done this for us, when we come back to conquer Jericho, and they did, and killed everyone in the town, he, she said, the, the spies told her, leave that scarlet rope, a red rope, hanging out of that window. And when we see that, that, that scarlet rope hanging out of your window, you and anybody in your household, your parents, your brothers, your friends, close relatives, right whoever's in there, will be saved. They won't die. What a great picture of the cross. A scarlet rope, right? The blood of Jesus saves us and delivers us from death. Amen? So again, as I've been saying, that's another great picture as I read that this morning. The Old Testament was pointing to the cross. Amen? That's a type and a shadow of the blood of Jesus, which saves us from death, a way out, a way of escape. The next thing that the cross, Jesus made a way on the cross, that we can escape the wrath of God that's coming. Because wrath is coming. But we don't have to be a part of it. Amen. Brother Francis believes that at least, right? It's coming, right, Brother Francis? But look what it says. Let me encourage you this morning. Romans 8, I'm sorry, 5, 8, 9. But God clearly shows and proves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. He died over 2,000 years ago before we were even born, knowing we'd be sinners yet. He died for us. Therefore, since we have been justified, right? We talked about that, justified and sanctified and glorified. Since we've been justified, declared free of guilt and sin by his blood, how much more certain is it that we will be saved from the wrath of God through him? Through who? Through Jesus, right? Because of the cross, because of the blood, We have a way out. We have a way of escape from wrath. Wrath is coming on this planet, on the people who rebel against the Lord. But for those of us who put our trust and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, come on, we have a way out of that wrath. Amen? 
Before we were saved, God proved he loved us by sending Christ. Now we're his children. Surely he loves us even more. See, Paul, the writing style of Paul was he was arguing from lesser to greater. If God saved us when we were his enemies, he will keep us, keep saving us even more so now that we are his children. Again, there is a wrath that's coming, but as born again believers, we will not experience it. Paul further argued that if Christ's death accomplished so much for us, how much more will he do for us even now, as Hebrews tells us, because he intercedes for us in heaven each and every day. Amen? Because Jesus lives, we are eternally saved and are spared from God's wrath. Christ also made us free from so many things, gave us a way out, right? Gave us a way out of things like a, a bondage from maybe addiction or grief. We all grieve, right? There's times of grief. I know we have brothers and sisters right now today that are grieving. But the Bible says we don't grieve like those that have no hope. Amen? Thessalonians says that. Why do we, we all going to grieve, it's natural, but we have a hope that the Lord has gave us a way out. A way out of the grave. A way out of, 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 of wrath. And we have hope that, that not only will we rise again, we'll, but we'll also spend eternity with our loved ones. Amen? So maybe you're in bondage, maybe it's some addiction, some grief, something that's been bound you down. There's so many other things we can go into here, but he made a way for you to be free and to be out of that. Amen? To escape sin, bondage, death, hell, and the grave. Amen? Number two, Christ made a way up for us. Christ made a way up. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly, everybody say boldly. boldly. Come on, say it boldly. boldly. There you go. We can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving, what? A way, a new life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. We talked about this in our study of Hebrews, but the, 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 the earthly most holy place was not freely accessible to anyone except the high priest, right? Once a year to go into the very presence of God. But because the very presence of God in heaven, we're talking about up now in heaven, because of the blood of Jesus and, and his sacrificial death on the cross, we have a way. We have this assurance of salvation. And this boldness rests on the finished work of our Lord Jesus is what the writer of Hebrews says here, right? On the Day of Atonement, the high priest could not enter. Once a year, Day of Atonement, but he could not enter unless he had the blood of a sacrifice. Thankfully, our entrance into God's presence in heaven is not because of an animal sacrifice, but because of Christ's shed blood. We'll be able to enter heaven not because of what we did, not because how we looked, not because how we dress, because because God the Father sees the blood of Jesus on us. That's our only access into heaven is the blood of Jesus. Amen. But we have that access. Amen. Last All last month's series, oh, and I, I showed you and encouraged you, that our whole life is an upward calling and journey to the Lord, right? To end up in our heavenly home. But here's some more great news. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven to get into God's presence. We already talked about it, and hopefully you experienced it this morning. We ain't got to wait to get to heaven. The third and final thing I want to show you this morning, number three, is God that made, Christ made a way in. Christ made a way into the presence of God through the cross. And that's what we see again, Matthew 27, 50 and 51. Then Jesus shouted out again and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two. Here's the key. From top to bottom. Top to bottom, we talk about it often, shows that this was not man's doing. It was the Lord's doing. Remember, this is the veil that kept him out of the holy of holies, the most holy place. And that veil, that thick veil, let them know you cannot go in there. No one can go in there. Only the high priest once a year in the Day of Atonement, and he had to have the blood of the sacrifice. If you don't know this, how thick the veil was, the veil in the temple back then was 60 feet long, or you can say high, 30 feet wide, and as thick, they said it in the times, Josephus and the old Jewish historian said it's as wide as a man's hand, a human hand, about approximately four inches thick, they said that this veil was. It's also said that if you tied horses, if they would tie horses to each side of the veil and those horses would take off, even horses couldn't split this veil. That's how thick and how hardy it was. But God made a way because he's a way maker. And as soon as Christ died on the cross, the Bible says one of three things happened. That veil tore from top to bottom. Just like if me and you took a loose, loose, loose leaf piece of paper 
I don't know why I keep getting myself into tongue twisters this morning. And you ripped it. How easy it is to just rip a sheet of paper, right? With your hands. Anybody, could, the child can do that, right? That veil tore just like that from top to bottom. Amen? Look at Hebrews 10. Let's jump back over to Hebrews 10, 20, 22. By his death, we've been talking about for three weeks now, his death on the cross. By his death, Jesus opened a new, and I love this, life-giving way through the curtain. That's the veil there. Through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us, I love this, go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. Well, Brandon, I can't. Well, Brandon, I I did this, but Brandon, there's no way. I love it. He says, let's go right into the presence of God. Why? Well, Brandon, I I messed up this week. I can't, I couldn't enter into worship this morning because I messed up. Maybe you sinned or I, I, okay, well, are you a born again believer? Look what this next verse says. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. I'm not saying this gives us, this gives us a license to, to, to go into, uh, literal, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, will, willful sin. That's the word I'm looking for. Willful sin and just do what we want. No, but we all gonna make mistakes. We all gonna mess up. Don't allow your guilty conscience to prevent you from coming into the presence of God. Cause the blood of Jesus has washed your conscience clean. If you're a born again believer and we all mess up, we all do it. We all miss it, right? We all fall short, right? That's what the Bible says. That's what sin means. We all miss the mark. We're shooting to be godly. We're on this sanctification process. But when you miss it, if you feel guilty, if you feel condemned, it's not the Lord. It's the devil. The enemy is condemning you. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. No, you can go right into the presence of God because of the blood of Jesus, because of the cross. Amen. Jesus' death on the cross gives us full access to the Father. We have access to the presence of God anytime. Don't wait till Sunday morning, church. We got, we got access anytime and we can have intimacy with God anytime as well. I think about this. My son moved out of our house about two years ago, but he still has a key to our house. So he still has access to our house. And our food, by the way, too. Amen. How many of you parents that have kids that move out know what I'm talking about? Amen. And and we we gladly do it. I'll be sitting in my chair. I hear that door unlock and it comes. Hey, bud, what's going on? How you doing? Oh, I I ran out of milk. I need some, you know, it's just like, help yourself, bud. Right? That's what parents do, right? Like, we got plenty of milk. He still has access to my house. Why? Because I'm his father and I love him. And I gave him that access. So he knows he don't even have to knock on the door. He just... Puts his key and opens up and comes right in. What a great picture of us, y'all. The key for us is the cross. He's given us full access. Amen? Even for eternity. Talk about even to our food. He has access to our food, right? Come on, we're going to be, we're going to be feasting at the marriage supper of the Lamb when we get to eternity. Amen? Full access to all the Lord's provision, to His glory, to His greatness, to whatever it is. Come on, I'm looking forward to that. All those good foods we eat down here that we, we're not supposed to because of the calories and the sugar. I believe we're going to have all that in heaven and, and we're going to have glorified bodies. It won't even matter. Amen. We can enjoy those things and it won't even matter. Come on. That's not in the Bible, but it ought to be. Amen. <laughs> the way into God's presence. I love this. It says it's new, which means the word there in the Greek, new, means it's, it's recent and it's fresh. In other words, not recent like it happened last week. It's not a part of the Old Covenant. It's not a part of the Old Testament. It's not a part of the law. This new and life-giving way is only through the blood of Jesus. I love that. You Don't just pass over words like that. It's new. It's recent, fresh. The, 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 this is because Christ is alive. This new and living way is because Christ is alive. Amen. And we can come to God through him, our high priest, as Hebrew says. When Christ's flesh was torn on the cross and his life was sacrificed, God tore the veil in the temple from top to bottom to symbolize a new life given way for all who believe. It's not for everybody. If it's for those who believe. So those that are born again, those that have put their trust and faith in Christ. See, our base is on this assurance that we have this boldness. I love it boldly right now coming to the presence of God because of what Jesus did. We have an open invitation to enter into the presence of God. I love that. I was thinking about that this morning too as I was going over my notes. Uh, We got a text from one of my aunts just yesterday and she invited us. We have a family reunion coming up in April. And she said, hey, we would love for y'all to be able to come. Come anytime after 11. Come anytime after 11, y'all can come. That's when it starts, right? 
And so it's an open invitation for the rest of the day to just come who can come. I started thinking about that. The, the way open to God wasn't forever for everybody. There was a certain time it opened. And it's when Jesus died on that cross. And he resurrected out of that grave. Amen? Now, any time after that, we have open access and invitation into the presence of the Lord. Amen? Since the time Christ died on the cross, we're so, we, we're privileged, saints, that we can dwell, not just visit, we can dwell in the presence of God every moment of every day. What a tremendous privilege this is. Amen? Come on, somebody. As we close, I'm going to get the worship team to come back up. And I, I want us to try to get into God's presence again. And hopefully you still are before we leave today, even just to focus on him. Our God is a way maker. And he made a way for us out, up, and in. And he used Christ's death on the cross as the vehicle to make that happen. Amen? Come on, how many of y'all are thankful for the cross this morning? Thankful for the blood of Jesus. That we can be set free and, 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 and escape and be out of bondage and sin and wrath, and death. Yes, our physical bodies will die, but we're, we're, it's not the end. Amen? And then up, we know that we have access to the heavenly presence of God. And then, of course, in His presence every day, we have access. He made a way into His presence today. I want to read one more verse that I read already. I say another verse. As we close, He says, right, He's the way maker. He is the way. John 14, 6 says this, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Only way to have access to God's presence today, tomorrow, the days ahead, and to have access to the heavenly most holy place that we'll spend eternity, you must come through Jesus. There's not multiple ways. It's not being a good person. It's not giving money. It's not serving. All those things is great. You need a tithe. You need to do all these things. Serve. That's awesome. We, we honor that, encourage that. None of that's going to give you access into the presence of God. On this earth, our free eternity. Amen? Would you bow your head and just close your eyes with me this morning? He says, I am the way, the only way, the truth. This gospel message is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Eternal life is only found in Christ and the finished work on the cross. Again, my brother's wife passing just a couple of days ago, my age, just so sobering again, and just reminds me, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how many times you went to church. Young people, listen to me. Whatever head bowed, every eye closed. I, you don't have to look at me and listen. I don't want you to be distracted. You are not promised tomorrow. You're not promised this afternoon. I'm not promised this afternoon. We may not make it to the second service. That's the reality. Kelly's home going is a reminder of that. Please don't pass up, pass up this opportunity to surrender your life to Christ to be born again. All these promises of the way that God has made is for those of us who have repented of our sin and placed our faith in Christ. If you say, Brandon, if that was me, if it was my funeral tomorrow, I don't know where I'd be spending eternity. I don't know where if I would be eternally separated from the Lord or with Him in glory. But today, Brandon, I want to make sure. Or the wrath of God, what about that? Are you confident that the, when the wrath of God comes, it's not going to fall on you? If you can't say confidently 100%, no, I'm not going to experience God's wrath, then it means you're not saved. You're not born again. Those of us that are saved, we know, not because of what we've done, but because of the cross. If either one of those, if you're not sure, if you say, Brandon, I don't know where I'd spend an eternity, or I don't know if the wrath of God is coming for me, then you need to make a decision today. If you say, Brandon, ask me, I need to surrender my life to the Lord. Whether you're in here in person or watching online, just slip up your hands to the Lord right now. Say, that's me, man. That's me. That's me right now. I need to give my life to Christ. I need to be born again. I see your hands, ma'am. Amen. Anybody else? Sir, over here. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, young people raising their hand. Sir, right here. Amen. Anybody else? Over here. Amen. If you're watching online, I can't see your hands, but it's most important. The Lord sees your hands and your heart. Come on, can we all pray this together? Lord Jesus, 
Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I know that I've sinned, Lord, and I repent of my sin. Thank you for making a way that I can be forgiven of my sin. Thank you for making a way out for me. Thank you for making a way to heaven. And thank you for making a way into your presence. Come on, tell him, I surrender today, Lord. I give you my all. Would you help me, Holy Spirit, to live a life that glorifies you? In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. Come on, let's celebrate with these this morning. Come on, if you surrender your life and made that decision, fill out the connection card in the chair in front of you. Watch it online. There's a link you can click there online. Hey, would you stand up with me? Don't leave yet. I, I, want, us to, I want us to worship one more time before we leave today. Amen. Amen. We're going to worship here in a minute. Come on, let's continue to pray through these three things right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Amen. Come on, as the worship team comes. Come on, let's pray. Come on, let's pray through these three things right now as the worship team's coming right now. Father, I thank you, Lord. Come on, let's thank you right now. Maybe you was one of those that you said that you feel like you had a burden on you. Father, I thank you that you made a way out, that you made a way out for us, Lord God, to be able, uh, Lord, to uh, be delivered, Lord God, from death, from stronghold, death, hell, and the grave, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that there's a way up. Come on, how many of you are thankful that heaven's our destination? that eternity is our destination. Amen. Lord, we thank you and that we have a way into your presence. Now, come on, lift up your hands as we just, we make a decision to worship again and just declare that he is a way maker before we head out today. Thank you, Lord God, that you are our way maker. You are a miracle worker. You made a way on the cross. Lord, we look forward to you, Lord God, to what you're doing in here tomorrow, next week, and every day, Lord, in Jesus' name. Come on, let's worship. us of the cross of who you are 
but God, in the power and the wonderful work. Lord, as we just continue on and focus on, let God celebrate the resurrection next Sunday. May we have a heart for the lost and, the, and compassion for those, Lord God, that need you and love you. I thank you for those that made a decision today. Bless these as they go, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said amen and amen. Well, God bless you. We love you. If you need prayer for anything, the pastors and all the workers will be here to pray with you. If not, have a great day. See you Sunday.